Okay, so today I wanted to talk about improving the quality of your top surface finish. Uh, depending on what you're printing, there's a lot of different things that factor into this, but there's a couple of them that are fairly universal. And first of all, calibration. If your filaments are not calibrated, you're going to have some rough top surfaces. Uh, if you have an X1 series printer, awesome, run your auto calibrations. As long as you're not using something that is transparent or shiny or has metal added to it, like glitter filaments or whatever, this works great. Uh, if you don't have an X1, if you're working with a different, like an Ender or something, uh, or you are using those materials and do have an X1, do the manual calibrations. There are more calibrations built into Orca. They work great. The ones that are built into Studio, they also work great. Um, there's information about these, about how to run them. If you click on the wiki link in Studio, it brings up a lot of good information. I think there's more detailed information, however. If you go over and look at the Orca documentation, it actually gives you a little bit more uh, real-world examples, of which I will say if you are doing the manual calibrations, the most common thing I hear about this, ignore the edges. You only care about the middle. That's what you're evaluating. The edges are pressure advanced. The middle is flow. So don't worry about the edges when you evaluate these. If they look super, super uh, similar and you can't really tell them apart, I run my fingernail across them to feel which one has uh, the smoothest finish that way. That can be a really good help. Follow these examples. I'll put links to these these pages in um, in the video. But uh, Ellis also, I, I've gone back to Ellis many times. Even though the techniques in here really aren't all that relevant to what we're doing, the information is fantastic. It explains what pressure advance is, how it works, why we care about it. Give some examples uh, of what pressure advance being too high and too low looks like, um, how you can kind of tune that in. Strongly recommend giving these videos a little look. Uh, or I'm sorry, these, these pages, a quick read through. Great information there. But back to our example. What are we doing? How are we improving this? I don't want to add a bunch of time and a bunch of material to make a model look good. We can do that effectively without doing so. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm printing out some uh, book holders that I've designed, and I'm using a, a fun uh, co-extrusion filament, and I'm using the Hilbert curve on here, so if I come in and slice it and look at it, I have these really interesting effects, but I wanted to try and get as many different appearances off the plate as possible using that three-color co-extrusion filament. So I rotated these things around and made them assemblies, so I have these, this kind of like pattern. And I did this because when I come in here and look at my preview, and this is something, this is where you need to consider this on your models. I'm just going to look at this top one real quick. I can control what my top surface looks like, what pattern I'm using. I can control how it, uh, how it goes down. I can control my solid infill layer. I can change that to whatever pattern. Okay, fine. But then what is this, this light blue layer that comes out? Well, if you look at the color map, this is a bridge layer. It's a bridge layer because this is the first of my top surface layers. Right beneath this is going to be infill. Okay, so it's a bridging layer, and you've got a bridge direction. But bridge direction doesn't do anything, and not with your top surface bridge layer. This is determined by the slicer based on the geometry of your model, and to my knowledge, you have no way to control it. You can rotate the model, you can change all these numbers. This will draw the same every time. It's up to the slicer to determine how it wants to do it. Okay, so this is important. You want to look at this and see what direction this is going to print in. From here, I'm then going to tweak what my infill direction is to try and make this as perpendicular as I possibly can. So zoom in a little bit more because if I get in real close, it'll show up a little bit better. My goal is to try and make this angle as close to 90 degrees as possible. Looking at that red line for my infill and the blue line for this bridging layer. It doesn't have to be perfect, but the closer it is, the better. 
So in this case, the default infill direction, I think for every standard profile is 45 degrees. If I were to take this assembly and change it to use 45 degrees, let's see what we get. Go back and slice it. It's not bad. It would probably print okay. I've got multiple points of contact for every bridging layer as it cuts across. It'd probably be fine. But if I scroll back in my playthrough, let's find where it actually draws those. Look at this one. As this line cuts across, it'll touch here, it'll touch here, it'll touch here, it'll touch here, and then it makes contact with the wall. Next one's going to do the same. I've got multiple points of contact. It'll probably be fine. Well, what if I did this the worst possible way and we made that zero? Just trying to emulate a possibility. Maybe the, uh, the slicer decided this is how it wanted to put it down, or this is how the model was oriented when it decided to print. But these lines going horizontal now across, uh, across my X, and these lines being pretty much the same, I'm not going to get quite as many points of contact. In fact, like this line, let's find it again. It's like this line right here. When it draws across, it's not touching anything until it gets all the way down here. Now this is a small model. It's not going to be the end of the world, but that line is going to sag just a little bit. It's not going to be well supported underneath it. And the line after it is going to do the same thing. When this one draws across here, there's nothing supporting it from wall to wall. If these areas are small enough, it can bridge okay, it'll probably be fine. If I change that back to 90, however, and look at this again, let me find where it draws that. Now as it draws across, those lines are going to have one, two, three, four, five, six points of contact as they work their way across. The smaller those gaps, the smaller that bridge, the better that will print. By that I mean these lines will be flatter. That matters because when I get up here to my next layer, as these lines go down, if there are lines beneath it that are sagging, these will sag as well. It'll come down and reach one of those little valleys and sag down in with it before it reaches a well-supported area and continues on its way. Okay, well, if you're just printing, it's probably fine. That top layer, let's imagine that I wasn't using Hilbert Curve on this and that was going down in this direction. It would probably look okay, but it wouldn't be super smooth. And if I want that to be really, really smooth, I need to make sure I've gone through to orient that infill with this bridge layer. Very specifically, especially because if you're using ironing, a lot of folks say use ironing to give you a smoother top surface. And what that does, once you've, once you've got your top layer down, it's going to come back and make another pass to try and smooth it all out. It deposits a tiny little bit of material, 10% of my normal flow. As it puts that tiny bit of material down, if it reaches one of those valleys where my first top surface layer, that bridge layer, wasn't very smooth, the layers above it aren't going to be terribly smooth either, and then it comes along to do the ironing, that tiny bit of material has nothing to stick to. And it's going to kind of pill up as though, you know, like fuzz on a sweater or fuzz on wool socks. And, I mean, the purpose of ironing is to give you as mirror-like a finish as possible. It can't do that if it looks like you glued sand to your print. So, yeah, just as a, a cumulative effect, you line that infill up so that you have as small a gap as possible between that bridging layer and your infill. That layer is smoother. That layer will be smoother. This layer will be smoother. I'm doing this without adding extra layers to this. By common knowledge, a lot of people say, oh, well, if it's not smooth, just add more layers. And that's true. That will do a lot to help you because as it puts down consecutive layer after layer after layer, it'll start to build up and start to smooth out. But if you're doing that, you're adding time, you're adding material that may not be necessary to your print. Maybe you're already printing four or five layers thick, or maybe you're printing a, a really thick uh, layer height, like 0.28. You, 
if you want to go through and add more layers that add more time, that add more mass, that chew up more filament, you can, and it will help. But it's not necessary, is the point I'm getting at. And this is really important if you're printing with a finer layer height. Like, let's say you're pointing 0.12. Well, you definitely need more layers anyways, just to build up the amount of material there. But let's say I'm using 7, 8 layers of 0.12. Do I really want to have to do 12 layers or 15 layers to try and build that up enough so it's actually smooth when I can make all of that so much easier just by changing that one number for my infill direction to make sure that prints out smoother? Real quick on that, this is a very easy example because I'm, I'm a big fan of aligned rectilinear. I think it works great, especially for a lot of models like this where the walls are thick in there. It's a small object, so it's plenty strong. I don't have to worry about the infill too much. It's really just here to support the top surface. A lot of people like to use gyroid. I like gyroid. It's a good infill. I don't have a problem with it. It can be hard to tell where the lines are when you start looking at it though. I mean, if you're looking at a big spacious model that has lots of infill in it, that can get really hard to determine where those lines are. So as I'm looking at it here to make that easier, down here in the very bottom right, you got this little toggle for show one layer only. That can make it a lot easier to say, okay, these lines are going, you know, this direction, and then I go up one and they're going opposite. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. I don't have an issue with that. The trick with gyroid, especially because it's so hard to really see that, what that top layer of gyroid looks like. What if I put this, uh, if that's 90, put that back to the default of 45, what does that look like? Okay, that would probably actually be ideal. Because I've got my lines very straight along what would be my y-axis here this is going across the X, that would be great. So what if I turn that to the worst possible orientation? Which, this is something that could happen depending on the orientation of your model, depending on how it's printing, you know, just things to watch out for. Well now, as I had before, I have layers that are going to print in here, or have lines in here, they're going to print with no support. As this line cuts across, it maybe touches a tiny bit right here, and then it touches here. The next one that cuts across has no support from wall to wall. That line would sag. The next one up gets a little bit of support here. It misses this one. Probably sag just a little bit right here. So using gyroid, right here, this little area would sag down some. And if I were to then try and iron over this layer, I would get some ugly effects right here. I guarantee it. So, yeah, picking out the right orientation, the right infill pattern, and really inspecting it, especially when you're really, really concerned about what your top surface layer looks like, makes a tremendous difference in how these things will print and how they will look.